Megalophobia is described as the fear of large objects. When you stand at the foot of something so monumental, you can't help but feel like your whole existence, your whole identity, is nothing but a bug in comparison to that colossus. As humans, we are used to dealing with things that don't go beyond two orders of magnitude in each direction. Go further than that on each side and it will either become invisible to our eyes, or it ceases to be an object and becomes a location. Something that demands one's active movement to be fully conceptualized and explored. In real life, we don't usually have to deal with anything much larger than a building or much smaller than a pinprick. But what happens to proportion and architecture when we design a world for giants? This happens. The last thing I expected to feel when playing a game about mechas was a lingering sense of dread, and actually I think I'm pretty weird for thinking that, so let me try to explain how this feeling came to me. I am not an Armored Core veteran, I hopped on the bandwagon along with the other FromSoft fanboys, but let me tell you, this game genuinely impressed me. This is a game about scale, it's a game about power, and a game about speed. Not only does it have really fun gameplay, but it also introduced me to the mecha genre, which was one thing that I never had a lot of interest in most of my life. Stuff like Gundam, Evangelion, and others like it never really caught my attention. My experience with giant robots was limited to a few episodes of Power Rangers back when I was like 6, and Origins from Black Ops Zombies. But that changed, I am not the same man I was one game ago, and after playing Armored Core, I could only get to one conclusion. That being, naturally, that. But are they really? Conceptually, absolutely. Imagine controlling a huge robot that fires guns the size of an SUV. That sounds metal as fuck, but in practicality, not really. Even the most advanced pseudo mechs we have nowadays are still slow, janky and with imprecise movement. But reality is even more simple than that. Take one of the most famous formulas in the world, not, not that one, the other one. Force equals mass times acceleration. Have you ever thought about what exactly this formula means? If you manipulate it a little bit, you can find out that the more massive something is, the harder it is to change its current speed, even if that speed is zero. That's why it's impractical to make something heavy move very fast. And that's the part when you look at me and say, counterpoint, every vehicle ever. I know, yeah, that's true, but how fast do they accelerate? The fastest accelerating car in the world as of the making of this video is the Rimac Nevera, going from 0 to 60 miles per hour in 1.85 seconds. That's 96.5 km per hour to the people using the correct measurement system. If we do a little calculation, we find out that this means we are accelerating at 26.7 meters per second squared, or roughly 3 Gs, which is already half of what an untrained human can sustain without dropping like a sack of bricks. This is my armored core, and as you can see, it is going really fast in one direction, and in less than a second, it goes very, very fast on the other direction. They call you 6 to 1 because that's how many G forces you can take. I tried looking up how much an AC weighs, and the results range from 8 to 800 tons. I could try to estimate it through a very rough model, but I'm lazy. What I can tell you for sure is that the speed counter over there on the left is not using either kilometers or miles. I did a little test and I saw that my dash covered 93 meters in about 1.274 seconds. This means that my little guy goes from 0 to accelerating on an average of 62.6 meters per second square. That's over twice the acceleration of the Rimac Nevera coming from a thing that is, conservatively speaking, 10 times heavier. Ignoring how much force is necessary to make something that massive accelerate that quickly, it's still a pretty reasonable number. 62 meters per second square is about 6 Gs, which is a lot, but not fatal. However, considering that I can dash in one direction and in less than a second have the same top speed on the other direction, that's gonna be at least 12 Gs, and not even a fighter jet pilot can take that much. Oh, but 6 to 1 went through augmentative surgery to take more Gs. Whatever, what matters is that you're controlling a robot that is like 3 to 4 stories tall and it's moving like it's speedrunning ultra kill. If something like that could exist in real life, being that big, that destructive and that fast, you wouldn't be watching this video, because we would all have perished in World War 3. Unfortunately, mechas in real life would probably have top speeds of maybe 60 km per hour in order to not turn the pilot into mush. And in case it was controlled remotely, which makes a lot more sense, there probably aren't any materials strong enough to keep it operational after getting a good direct impact from an RPG. Millions, maybe billions of dollars invested into something that ultimately won't do shit. But the armored cores themselves, the fictional version? Holy shit. 
I struggle to think of any modern military technology short of an ICBM that could potentially counter an AC. It can circle around a tank faster than it can turn its turret, and it can absolutely mow through ground troops like it's a fucking combine. And being airborne doesn't matter, because it can literally jump to the altitude of a helicopter. What can you even do against something this powerful and this versatile? Nothing much, really. I was going to talk about how this game is scary, and this is a scary part for me, but I actually wanted to touch on a subject that is a little bit more... subtle. Armored cores, MTs, everything in Rubicon 3 is built on a scale that is utterly unfathomable to our flimsy little human minds. The very first mission has you fighting a helicopter. This helicopter. Remember that the robot you're controlling is 10 meters tall. How the f does something like that keep itself in the air? How can it even be built conceptually? But that's not all. Look behind you. Those massive metal structures you see all around you. I have no idea what they are. Maybe they are space elevators, maybe they are a logistic rail network connecting the different grids of the planet, maybe they are something else entirely, but they are everywhere. How many million tons of metal go into making something like that? How does it keep itself standing? There is a late game mission where you are trying to infiltrate a base deep underground and you fall for a comically long amount of time before you hit the bottom. When playing this game, a lot of the time you lose sense of scale because you are controlling things and seeing things from the perspective of a giant robot. You thread through these claustrophobic corridors that are actually bigger and wider than avenues. There is also the opposite experience, when you come across some vast structure that you need to climb to the top of, or enter somehow, and you don't even think about how this thing is probably taller than most skyscrapers. You are there, cruising through the stage at ludicrous speeds while decimating everything with your dual Zimmermans, which unfortunately got nerfed. And every now and then, in the quieter moments, you notice something is off. Like a normal sized car, a residential building, or even just a door. And then suddenly, there's this uncanny realization that dawns on you that you're controlling something so fast, massive and powerful that nothing quote-unquote human size has even a sliver of chance of putting up a fight against you. The result is a world that has been built and deformed so that it could fit you. Everything you see is either the same size, slightly smaller or much bigger than your mech. A world that can house machines this big and this fast needs to be thought of in colossal proportions. This little guy I showed in the beginning of the video is a mobile mining rig. This machine is 1.5 times taller than the f***ing Burj Khalifa. The proportion is even more ludicrous when you look at its length of about 5 kilometers. It would take an average human about 1 hour to walk from one side to the other. The rest of the game is filled with things that are about as absurd as this. And while playing it, it really puts things into perspective. Who built these? Were they built by human hands? Given their scale, probably not, they were most likely built by machines. But then you ask, how many machines? How big were they? How much work went into getting all the material and assembling the mega structures that tower over the mountains and obscure the skies? Imagine the logistics and the labor that went into all of this. There are a few things in the real world that have an equivalent size, but the structures in this game make real world shit like the Panama Canal or the Three Gorges Dam look like high school science projects. And given how large they are and how abundant they are, just how much work and how many hours went into building all this? The planet Rubicon 3 is being violated, bled dry of all its resources to feed the insatiable Giga Corporations. The specific thing they're after is called Coral, which is an extremely energy dense self replicating source of fuel. It's weird to think that energy would be something that they're after, since a civilization that can build shit like this probably dishes out Dyson spheres like their slurs in a modern warfare lobby. But this need for energy actually makes a lot of sense, as it is something that grows with the development of a civilization. That's the whole point of the Kardashev scale. Even though a Dyson Sphere could absolutely provide enough energy for all the shit you see in the game, the project is so resource intensive, some estimates say that to gather all the material necessary to build it, you quite literally need to disassemble an entire planet. Coral is considerably more practical to extract, but even so, structures of this size require inordinate amounts of manpower and energy to assemble and maintain. Just imagine the cranes needed to build this, the size and amount of machines needed to transport all the raw material to these structures, and more importantly, how does one cope with the fact that there's literally a commute to get to the bathroom at the end of this hallway? No, but for real, what percentage of these structures are habitable? How do you plan sewage and plumbing for places like these? There are certainly people using these structures, so how do they do things? Some of the facilities you see in game will have whole ass avenues leading in and around them, but it's hard to imagine that there would ever be traffic to enter this one reactor core. 
So why are they here? Maybe for the larger vehicles, but we don't really see those unless there's some sort of really heavy artillery like this 30 meter tall tank zooming around like it's an omnidirectional Bugatti. When you really stop to look at it, the proportions of this world don't make any sense. Why are there roads so wide for just a handful of buildings? Surely the towns must have been built for the people operating these gigantic facilities, but if they're so massive and outside is so prone to getting blitzkrieged by a giant robot, why not just build housing inside the structures? And additionally, why are things built so monumentally massive? Turns out that the best defense against a giant robot is just regular sized rooms. Why would they build so high up? Why bore so deep underground? The answer is simple, and I've already said it earlier in the video. This planet is being cracked open and completely stripped of every resource. Mining operations on a scale 10 times bigger than anything on Earth, maybe a hundred times. Not a single stone in Rubicon is to be left unturned. This world deals with corporations that spend the entire GDP of the European Union as pocket change. Frequently in fiction, we see things being aggrandized for the sake of poetic license. For example, the moon in the real world is something that you can cover with your thumb if you hold out your arm. But in fiction, you'll see it taking over half of the sky. Same goes for the majesty and scale of the buildings you see in fictional universes. Things are polished and perfected, crafted with aesthetics first and purpose second. Can you imagine the size of tsunamis we'd get with a moon of this size? How do you clean and maintain these buildings and cathedrals? These are nitpicky aspects that aren't really meant to be analyzed in too much detail. Sometimes the rule of cool is all the explanation you need. This particular sense of monumentality is rarely practical in the real world. Emphasis on particular, because if you think about it, we ourselves have become accustomed to living among gigantic things. I live in a pretty big city, and sometimes when I'm walking in the streets, what do you mean my YouTuber goes outside? Every now and then I take notice of the fact that absolutely everything I'm seeing has been manually put there. Those trees, planted. The dirt they're settled in, was placed there. All the buildings you see on your commute to work are a result of thousands of tons of concrete and steel being extracted from somewhere, moved, processed and erected, <laughs> erected into these massive things. That alone is a lot. Then you realize that you're in the middle of thousands, maybe tens of thousands of those. This is the result of maybe 200 years of modern civilization. Imagine a hundred more. Imagine a thousand. At what point will we ever warrant the need to build facilities this colossal? Artillery this potent and vehicles this insane? That's the interesting part. Armored Core tells a very human story on a scale of gods. Exploitation of resources and control over territory. You've seen it told with sticks, swords, assault rifles, and now you're seeing it being told with giant robots with a Neko Arc decal. Will we, as a civilization, ever need to build this big? Unlikely. Constructors of this magnitude represent two things, greed and hubris. One planet wasn't enough to sustain the avarice of one civilization, so they had to expand, not to colonize, but to drain the others by force. To Archibus and to Balin, time is money, and the Rubiconians are wasting their time. As you play through Armored Core 6, the anti-corporative message is pretty blatant, even if it doesn't really yell corporal bad in your face. You play the role of a mercenary whose sole purpose is to steamroll anything and anyone who is in between you and the completion of your contracts. There is treason, backstabbing, resentment, all in the name of profit. There's even a mission where you get the option to betray your squadmates for the sake of a bigger pay from the opposing side. In Rubicon, human lives are at best a minuscule speck in comparison to the forces at play. I don't know about you, but I felt a tinge of cosmic horror in this game about giant robots beating the shit out of each other. The only difference is that instead of giant eldritch gods, you have mega corporations, and instead of ancient curses, you have Lockheed Martin. These companies are on a scale so massive and powerful that the flimsy human mind can barely make sense of it. I'm willing to bet that the Vespers can absolutely wreck Nair Lakultep's shit like he's made out of warm butter. And isn't that scary? In conventional cosmic horror, you have your little village settled above a slumbering deity, and every now and then you see someone gouging their eyes out and yelling at the sky. In Rubicon, if you're settled above a coral deposit, you get nuked by an orbital laser. In both scenarios, you're seeing something that is so massively and celestially powerful, there's nothing that you as a human could ever do to stop them. Are humans even capable or responsible enough to wield the power of gods, the power to build and destroy things of this size? Is that the message that Armor Core 6 is trying to convey? No, the message is that mechas are cool and war crimes are based.